Here we go. What kind of chess player are you? Answer 20 questions and find out the best openings for your style. Ooh, interesting. Which friends are most likely you? Okay, I, I think I'm the only one on Facebook who's taking this test. And uh, which master are you most like? So take the quiz. All right, let's do it. Okay, which side would you rather play in the following position? Black to move. Oh boy, so this is... Uh, Oh, hopefully you guys can see this. Yeah, I think okay showing up fine uh, This looks like a pretty typical like 95 sacrifice in the Sicilian white played 95 black took e takes d5 uh, I guess it comes from like bishop g5 knight or looks like And now black can castle because bishop on e I, I already know I would take white here I'm just kind of going over the position. I mean it's supposed to be unclear, but I really hate positions where I, I have extra material, but my uh, my king is like in, in terrible shape and I have to find like super precise moves to defend. I would much rather just be the attacking player and I have all these ideas, knight f5, knight c6, rook e7, queen h4, so many options. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to take white here. Okay, number two, when you play in tournaments do you usually score with consistent results or do you often perform on the extremes either really well or really poorly uh, in general I have pretty consistent results I'm usually doing okay like plus one plus two I usually don't have like like I've never gotten a GM norm so I haven't had a super outstanding performance and I, I also haven't had like a really bad performance in a while I mean it occasionally but but not too often so go with pretty consistent results uh, which best describes how you think about this position in the Sveshnikov Sicilian? Ooh, tough question. <laughs> black has given up a critically important d5 square, uh, or black has given up, black has lots of potential counterplay with the bishop pair and the f5 pawn break. I mean, both are correct. Black has given up the d5 square, and black has lots of potential counterplay with the bishop pair and the f5 break. This is all, both, both statements are true. I don't know exactly what they're asking me. I guess they're they're asking who would I take? Would I take white or would I take black? Um, I don't know. I think I, I like black's position here. I mean, uh, I wrote a book on the open Sicilian, so I'm usually taking white against the Sveshnikov. I do feel like black has given up the square, but um, I think the counterplay is... Uh, if you asked me this, like, before the World Championship match where Carlsen started playing the Sveshnikov, I would say A, but after seeing Magnus's games and him showing that these lines are very, very dangerous for white, I'm going to have to go with B. Okay, which statement is closer to the truth? I bring my best game when facing opponents I dislike. I don't really notice my opponent. Uh, I would say B. I actually, I don't like playing players that I have any kind of relationship with, whether I like them or don't like them. It just distracts me from the game. I would rather, uh, I would rather go with B here, where I, I try not to notice my opponent and just focus on the moves. Okay, number five. Black has just played G5. Your first instinct is to take on G5, of course. Retreat to G3. I mean, I'm not sure if I would take on G5, but for sure this would be my first instinct. Um, so I, I'm gonna hit A here. But let's see. Is it actually good? Take, take, take. Then white goes e4, and like rook is already ready to lift along the or swing across the third rank. Yeah, it looks crushing. I'm definitely going to take on g5 here every time. I have a feeling they're going to turn me out into uh, some kind of hacker where, I don't know, I'm not really a hacker. Do you play gamuts? No, not really. Okay, how would you think about whether or not to take on g5 as white? Well, I would just do it. Uh, <laughs> okay, actually, this is a good question. I would evaluate the placement of the pieces to decide if the attack seemed promising. Or B, I would calculate several variations to decide if white's attack is strong enough. And again, the answer is C, I would do both of these things. I would first calculate and then I would evaluate. That's how normal chess players think. But um, okay, I see what I see the question they're asking. They're like, are you a calculator or are you an intuitive player? Um, I feel like I would probably be closer to A here, because uh, this is usually how I play. So I'm going to stick with A. Though I, I feel like in a game, I should really be focusing on the calculus. This is a tough question, a tough quiz, because it's not like, it's asking, you know, what would you do? But sometimes what you would do and what you would hope to do are two different things. 
Okay, under serious time pressure, you are more likely to A, miss a tactic, or B, move pieces aimlessly. Yeah, I definitely don't really try to do B too much, so I'm guessing, I guess A is more likely. Uh, which of these ideas do you prefer for white? White should trade bishops and put a strong knight on d4. Yep, I'm just going to hit A, uh, <laughs> which will temporarily prevent any counterplay from black doubling rooks on the c file by defending the c2 square. So yeah, pretty typical idea of playing against the French, putting this knight on d4, covering c2, then black's bishop is super passive. Or B, white should push d4, temporarily misplacing black's dark squared bishop, and then start on start an attack on the king side with f5, where black's king sits alone. Um, I mean, honestly, yeah, again, both are quite promising. I, I, yeah, a lot of these questions are like, are you an attacking player or are you a strategic player? Would you treat this position tactically or would you treat this position strategically? <laughs> Every question is just, just asking the same thing, but in a different way. Uh, they should just come right out and say it. Do you like tactics or do you like strategy? Choose a player, Tal or Karpov. <laughs> uh, but okay. Um, Let's actually think about the position. My instinct is to put the knight on d4. I, I would rather play this strategically. Uh, d4 and f5, I mean, also makes a lot of sense and looks like this would be really strong for white, so it's hard to say. d4 feels like it could be a stronger move, but yeah, actually, I don't know. d4, like, bishop, if the bishop could go back to f8 or e7, then it would be one thing, but d4, f5, and... Knight h5 is coming, f6, queen g3. Uh, yeah, I think I would go for d. In this position, I think d4 looks a lot better, actually, than, than taking on c5. Okay, you start the game out with 1d4. Would you rather your opponent play 1d5 or 1f5? Oh, that's not even... That's not even a, a choice. F5 all the way. I, <laughs> as Petrosian famously said, if your opponent is planning on playing the Dutch, do not stop them. <laughs> do not prevent them. So much easier to, to create some chances against the Dutch than against uh, d4, d5. Okay. You have been ahead of pawn for most of the game, but after tough resistance from your opponent, you have only five minutes left in this position. Should you play on or offer your opponent a draw? Okay, obviously we're going to keep playing. I'm an ambitious player. I'm not here. I mean, as soon as you make a draw, that's when you stop learning about the game. So, of course, we're going to keep pushing for the win. Now, if it was a little bit less time, if it was like 30 seconds on your clock, you know, no increment, then okay, yeah, maybe make a draw. But it's an extra pawn. Black's A pawn is under control. So I would play king c4 here, try to put my king on c5 and get in if black goes king d6. Then maybe try to bring my knight to d2 e4, try to b break the blockade. I mean, why does a pawn up knight end game? Absolutely, we should keep playing the win. It's not that complicated there. Um, which statement comes closest to your feelings? It's always a joy to be paired with someone you've crushed in the past. Or B, the odds of winning are slightly higher against opponents one has previously beaten. Interesting. So this one is actually saying the same thing. It's just that how big of an advantage is it to... Uh, to play someone that you've beaten before. I think I'm gonna go with B here. Uh, I don't, I, I feel like I always get nervous when I've beaten someone before, then the second game, okay, they're more used to my style, they're gonna treat it better, and, and so I feel like your chances are good, but they're not like amazing, so let's go with B. Okay, with plenty of time on your clock, what would you do in this position? A, trade on E6 and play Rook D7 because the end game is good for whites, uh, or uh, redirect the knight to c3 to preserve the better minor piece. B, uh, invest some serious time calculating whether knight takes e6 achieves anything concrete. Oh, interesting. Okay, so it's asking, again, are you going to treat this position intuitively or would you sit and calculate? So it's not saying whether you would go for knight takes e6. It's asking whether you would sit there and calculate knight takes e6 and, and see if it's working or whether it's actually, whether you would just play something intuitively like taking on e6 or just going back knight a4, knight c3. Uh, I don't think, mm, yeah, I guess there is some point to, to putting the knight on uh, a4, c3, because then you can come back to e2 and then uh, to the d4 square. <laughs> Honestly, my instinct is to just take and calculate this rook end game because it it looks it looks difficult for black. 
like rook d7, black goes rook e7, we bring the second rook to d1, black is kind of stuck, and then we just want to push on the queen side, like king b3, king a4, or a4, a5. I think I would just kind of go for this intuitively. Uh, I'm not sure I would spend too much time, but... Okay, with plenty of time on my clock, I think I am going to sit there and calculate. Because if it doesn't lead to much, then I would just go back. But I, I kind of feel like uh, I would I would probably just go for so I'm going to go with A. I, I'm more of an intuitive player. Um, what do you think of the famous saying, chess is 99% tactics? Oh, man. That's a tough one. Because what do they mean by that? Because tactics are important, even like a very strategic game, it's like a lot of times the positional goals have to be achieved by tactical means, and a lot of times like you don't play a move because you didn't notice some tactic along with it. Uh, it's hard to say. I'm going to go with yes. I think it is. I, I like. I think the spirit of the statement is more correct than it is not correct. It's not literally 99%, but the point is that like there are tactics behind every decision you make and so because of that it's like tactics are kind of uh very much involved so i'm gonna go ahead and agree uh but again i'm taking some liberty uh justifying the the spirit of the statement there and not taking it literally okay how do you feel about this wild gambit line for black with white to move <laughs> no way am i trying to lose it's a good way to put it B, I like my chances, and th this will definitely mess with my opponent. Uh, okay, what's going on here? We're down a whole rook. Uh, but this knight on h8 is out of the game. If we pick up the knight, then we have decent compensation for the exchange. But objectively, it's, like, super risky. And white goes queen g3. How does black play there? Bishop d6, queen g7. Hmm... I would go with A. <laughs> I don't think I want to go for this. Okay. After losing a game, have you ever broken something or yelled out loud? Yeah. I, I've been pretty upset or frustrated, punched the wall, that kind of thing. Uh, yelled in exasperation. We've all been there. Okay. White to play in castle. Okay. Queenside. I mean, it's not even, it's not even a question here. Just more active. This knight on c6 is not doing anything. I mean, we were talking about those French positions, the Rubenstein French with all these d takes e4, knight takes e4. I think white should always castle queenside. I, I tell you, they're going to paint me as this like super aggressive sharp player. And if you look at my games, they're all just like <laughs> quiet positional. Okay, which is closer to the truth? I get excited or nervous before a game. I don't worry about prizes, money, titles, or honors while playing. I just play my game. Definitely A. I, I think because I'm normally playing big events and I'm going up against GMs or like Ivancha, Kramnik, um, as well as like trying to play for norms and prizes and stuff. So yeah, I definitely do get nervous uh, before games. How would you come up with a plan in this position as white? Consider the strengths and weaknesses of black's position and decide where my pieces feel best. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, I would calculate some line for white to see how strong various possibilities are. Okay, again, the same question. Are you a calculating player or an intuitive player? Yeah, I would I would definitely go with A here because in this position, I, I think it's it's not a matter of just um, figuring out the what the right line is because I think white probably has a lot of choices here, but I think you have to just decide. Do you want to play E5? Do you want to play E takes D5 and then D4? Or do you want to just keep the tension with a move like Queen C2 or Queen E2? Uh, See, so yeah, I don't think, I don't think this is about calculation. I think this is about evaluating the position. Like, do I want to structure with e5, d4, and this bishop is on c7, or do I want to take on d5 first and then play d4, so I can put my knight on e5? I think these are the questions that White should be asking here. So I'm gonna go with a. Um, Lum asked, "What do you think is the worst mistake when trying to learn chess?" Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, four queens. Uh, tall is definitely uh, dynamic. Actually, tall is a tough one because it seems like he's a very intuitive player, but he was calculating a lot. So I guess I would put him dynamic intuitive because he would make a lot of these like speculative sacrifices. Uh, whereas Kasparov would be like dynamic and calculating, just like a machine. MVL as well, great example, like dynamic and calculating. Um, Nakamura, though, I, I feel like he's more dynamic intuitive, uh, as well as Anand, dynamic intuitive. Uh, okay, the worst mistake when trying to learn chess, uh, I think 
this one a lot of players make is when um, you switch around too much. So like one week you decide you're going to learn the Night Orf. Next week you're like, oh, I need to work on my end games. Next week you're like, oh man, my middle games are terrible. Next week you're like studying the Rui Lopez now. Uh, so bouncing around too much. I think uh, in order to really make your improvement effective, you should just choose one or two things to work on. Because we can all work on everything. We can work on calculation, openings, end games. There's no limit to how much you can work on something. But just choose one or two things that you feel like are your weakest points. Let's say your calculation, your middle game understanding, or maybe your openings are just bad and you have to build a repertoire. And then just focus on that for at least three, four weeks, a month. Uh, especially if you're going to do end games. You're not going to learn any end games if you just study for like three days. You, you look at some positions and then you never look at it again. You'll never remember anything. Uh, but if you study some theoretical end games for like a whole month and then you repeat it and you do some chess.com drills and all this stuff or you do chessable and you kind of like repeat it a lot, th that's the way to really uh, maximize your, your effectiveness. Um, <laughs> yeah, or spending all your time studying bishop and knight mate. Just watch one vi YouTube video and that's all you need. Okay, number uh, 20, which is harder for you to do? Identify my advantages in building a plan? Not really. Trade a good position for a strong attack. Yeah, I would definitely go with B here because I, I like attacking. I, I really do. And I, I feel like when I'm playing dynamically, my calculation can be good. But uh, I really hate when I have a good position and then I have to take a lot of risk to try and win because then I feel like, okay, if it goes wrong, why did I ruin my good position? Why did I take this risk? I'm down two pawns for nothing. <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, but A, I've always felt quite comfortable. You try to identify what squares are strong, where your pieces want to go, what your good plan is. Uh, so I would say B is definitely harder for me. Okay, guys, my chess personality, Prodigy. Ooh, nice one, like Magnus Carlsen. Actually, this this makes sense because I, I wasn't really a Prodigy when I was younger, but I, was, I had that style, like young, tricky, sometimes playing tactical. Um... As far as the previous scheme, I've always considered myself a uh, positional intuitive player. So, um, yeah, mostly strategic player and mostly uh, relying on my intuition rather than my calculation. But I do try to be uh, a bit more um, calculating as of late. So, okay, here's my breakdown. The Prodigy is the ultimate sportsman. Prodigies play aggressively and fight for the win from the beginning to the end, but place the highest value on maintaining emotional control and utilizing every opportunity that comes their way. Wow, couldn't have said it better myself, literally. Uh, <laughs> Prodigies are not out to prove any kinds of theories or to create great works of art. That's not true. I like art. I like art. Though that often happens anyway. Yeah, that's right. For Prodigies, winning is everything because winning is simply more fun. Yeah, actually, I don't know if this is accurate. I feel like I, I do enjoy the art of the game, but okay. And uh, yeah, so here are the different breakdowns, attacking versus positional. I would put dynamic rather than attacking. I think dynamic is a better word, but okay. So slightly more on the attacking side, somewhat uh, surprising. Aggressive, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Intuitive, yeah, I definitely uh, feel like I'm on the intuitive end. And uh, emotional versus calm, I'm more on the calmer side. Uh, <laughs> no, four queen. I didn't say I broke anything, actually. I, I yelled out. I've definitely yelled after losing a game. Just, like, exasperated. N never in the tournament hall. Like, I've never caused a scene or anything. But certainly, like, after leaving the tournament hall, I'm just like... Ah. You know, like, the Magnus, when he loses a Blitz game, he's just, like, slapping his hands weirdly and throwing a pencil at the wall or something. That kind of thing. So, yeah, actually, in this case, I'm very similar to Magnus, maybe. Uh, but I don't do that frequently. I just the question was, have you ever done that? And so yes, I have one time. But <laughs> okay. So it says Magnus Carlsen is a prodigy. He's a universal player with an intuitive grasp of chess. Much of Carlsen's success can be explained by his psychology, which is completely unencumbered by fear. He doesn't know fear. That's true. Uh, just he doesn't have that part of the brain that feels fear. Simply, he rarely makes any kind of blunders and plays on forever to try to win positions with the smallest advantage or even equal ones. His endgame play is superb and his constant pressing in every position eventually drives his opponents to make errors. Carlson is currently the highest rated player in history. Oh, cool, okay, in recommended openings it says Rui Lopez, Queen's Gambit. Okay, so E4 and D4, that's kind of weird. Uh, okay, so if you play E4 then you should play the Rui Lopez, if you play D4 you should play the Queen's Gambit. 
And as black, I should play the Rui Lopez or the Sicilian or the Grunfeld. Interesting. Uh, I've played the Rui Lopez before from black's point of view. Haven't played the Grunfeld, but I'd pick it up. And I do play the Queen's Gambit with white. Uh, I have heard Nimzovich saying, why must, must I lose to this idiot? Yeah, very, very famous phrase. Very, very true. I mean, <laughs> very relatable, I have to say. Sometimes, like, you feel like your opponent just hasn't played well, but they found one trick that you didn't, and it's just like, oh, man. <laughs> I, I can especially uh, see Nimzovich feeling that, like, I outplayed him. This guy doesn't even know what an outpost is. I invented the concept of outposts. And uh, still, I blundered this tactic, and now I'm losing. <laughs> Why must I lose to this idiot? Yeah, I get it. I get it. I mean, the guy, like, invented <laughs> good knight versus bad bishop positions. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but he's blundering tactics to, like, total patzers. Um, but if I remember correctly, I feel like he said it about an actually good player. But <laughs> I don't I don't remember who, who he was playing. Uh, anyway, guys, I think I'm going to wrap up the stream for tonight. It was definitely a fun time. 